spoke to Ivan Hannigan, um, our friend behind the Hutchinson Drought Index record that we looked at in Thing 7. And Ivan, I'll hand over to you now to tell us the story behind this record. Thanks, Jerry. So the reproducibility crisis has become known. Uh, I think Roger Penn coined the phrase in 2006. And what it basically boils down to is it's incredibly difficult to achieve the seemingly trivial task of loading up some data that uh, has been talked about in a paper and recalculating the exact uh, results that are from that paper. It seems trivial, but it's actually very, very difficult. And there's a lot of points in the road from research to data publication that stand in the way of this. It's nice to hear the feedback on the Hutchinson record being a linked uh, record between papers, software code, and data. And this is absolutely critical to the uh, solution to the reproducibility crisis. And so what I wanted to do today was to talk about the entire pipeline from my perspective and what Peng and others have termed the reproducible research pipeline, which leads through the chain of linkages from the author to the reader and the distribution of data, code, and papers. Now the interesting part of being a science student and designing your experiments and measuring data uh, in a lab and a, a fairly um, basic uh, educational um, setting turns into a bit of a bigger enterprise when you uh, start a large research interdisciplinary research project and measured data becomes a very difficult to define beast but you can imagine that you've got a fairly good idea about what data you want to find, you go out and get it or you uh, create it, and then you've got some electronic information. That's where coding can come in handy to turn that often messy and dirty, full of errors kinds of data, and often distinct um, across different data sets such as environmental, health, demographic, and you can combine all that data into something that you can analyse. If you want to correlate drought with a suicide incidence rate ratio, then you've got to uh, at least join some climate data, some deaths data, and some population and demographic data, often with spatial and temporal dimensions. Once you've done all that processing, you've got a computational process that also can create uh, new data, and you want to pay attention to analysing that in a, in a systematic and rigorous way, and code comes in handy here. And one of the things that the Hutchinson um, data set was connected to is a published software package full of analytic code that takes the analytic data, pumps out some computational results, creates some presentation uh, worthy output such as figures, tables, numbers, and then puts it all together with some text that we wrote into the report that you can download from the journal. All of these components of the pipeline can go down to the reader through the distribution channel which is what data publication and all the associated um, activities of the reproducible research pipeline are designed to do. Now, this solves a big problem called the reproducibility crisis, but there's an even bigger problem where you might have heard that some, uh, well, quite a lot of papers cannot be replicated in new study environments. Now, the adherence to the reproducibility um, pipeline framework goes some way to solving this more serious scientific problem by allowing readers who may want to replicate a study to develop an understanding of analytical methods, test new things to do with their code and different ideas, whilst benchmarking against published uh, validated computational results. That leaves the pipeline open to be extended with new measured data in new populations with new uh, errors and potentially new methods and insights so that the findings of the original papers can be replicated. And in this way, we can winnow out the wheat from the chaff in uh, our hypothesizing and design new experiments that more quickly give us scientific progress. So that's the overview of the pipeline and it is how I've tried to operate in my more recent papers, where the process of finding and getting the data is all systematically organised with a data management plan. 
I can get the data through the licensing and the I understand all the authorizations ethics. I have to put the data somewhere and that's quite challenging. It gets quite big. You have to back it up. Then you start doing stuff with data. There are multiple versions to control and different types. The measured data is not often something that the downstream reader will be able to use or probably wants to, but the analytical data is. The reader will want to find out more about what has been done with the data to arrive at the analytic data, and so scripts can be reviewed. And then you've got this sharing of data process with uh, the distribution channel, the digital object identifiers and other links and licensing all being held down there in the bottom of the pipeline. So that kind of brings me to the end of the description of the pipeline. But obviously in a real world environment it is never as simple as that. This I hope can um, you can see that I use flowchart diagramming software to um, track the multiple steps in protracted pipelines where data is fed in from the top and keeps going down to the bottom. Actually, it goes off the screen. This is about twice as big, but I could uh, only show you the top half with any legibility. And the final comment that I'd like to make it comes from a, a famous quote that data anal analyses are like sausages. It's really better not to see them being made. But I've extended that to say that even so, you do want to know what goes into them is high quality ingredients. Thank you.